Hello everyone and welcome to this tutorial entitled Topological Data Clustering. I'm very excited to have you here. My name is Peggy Kemeka. I'm from the University of Gaoundere in Cameroon. In this tutorial, I'm going to explain an excellent clustering algorithm method based on topology. This algorithm is called TOMETO, which stands for Topological Mode Analysis Tools. This algorithm has several advantages. For example, it can recover complex clusters. Moreover, it naturally detects outliers and noise. So it is an effective tool for dealing with noisy data. The plan of our presentation is given as follow. We will start with an introduction. And then we will give the key hypothesis or assumption in density-based clustering. After that, we will present tomato, followed by some useful remarks. The presentation will end with the conclusions and our reference. Clustering analysis is about finding the shape or the patterns of the input data. In clustering analysis, we wish to group together data points that are very similar. For example, here we have the red cluster and the blue one. The pipeline in clustering analysis is given as follow. We start with the input data and then we choose our preferred clustering algorithm that will then help us to detect the clusters. Let us see how it is done in practice. So here we are using Jupyter Notebook for Python. We start by generating our data. When we see here our data, we can imagine that we have two subgroups. Let us now train the model using tomato. When we train our model, we can see here that we have two dots and a lot of uh, dots in front of the diagonal on this persistence diagram. The detail about the algorithm we be given in the coding section. And also the explanation of this persistence diagram will be given later. Let's now plot the label clusters. We can clearly see that we have the two clusters that are labeled with different colors. So we can say that clustering is an unsupervised learning method because we have obtained our cluster without using the notion of training and testing data set. Moreover, we have no use the label data at the beginning. Why do you need to cluster our data? We need clustering because it provides a visualization tools that enable us to inspect our data. Moreover, clustering provides the internal structure of our data, and this is very useful for semi-supervised and when we are conducting uh, unsupervised learning. Practically speaking, we need clustering for customer segmentation. Because in customer segmentation, we need to group data points that are very similar to each other. And this can really help us to improve our marketing and sell. For example, let's say that you have your customer and you want to know the customer that will be more likely to be interested in, let's say, product A or product, product B. 
Clustering analysis will help us to detect these subgroups of our customers. And this is very useful in decision making. Moreover, clustering analysis is also useful in anomaly detection. For example, let's say that you are dealing with gene expression data. When you cluster our data, you can automatically detect, uh, let's say, a gene expression that has cancer. For example, here we have detected anomalous data point. Broadly speaking, clustering is divided into two subgroups, centroid-based clustering and density-based clustering. In centroid-based clustering, an assumption is made about the shape of the data, and this works well when we are dealing with small data. An example of centroid-based clustering is k-min. You can see that k is the number of cluster which is set when we are running the algorithm. On the other side, we have density-based clustering. In this density-based clustering, the data define the shape itself, and this requires a lot of data. We don't have any assumption at the beginning in centroid-based clustering. Some examples of centroid-based clustering are DBSCAN and METOMETO, which is going to be the algorithm of our interest in this talk. Just like in any density-based clustering algorithm, tomato make an assumption, which is data is drawn from an unknown probability distribution function, F. But the problem is that we don't know F. We don't know the probability density function. What we do is that we estimate this function by using, for example, kernel density estimation. In kernel density estimation, we place on every data point the a kernel function k. That will then help us to define the value of the function f of x like given here in equation one. In this function, we can say that we have to set the smoothing parameter h and the number of data points is already given from our data. Here we have one, two, three, five data points. Another function that we can use, or another way to estimate the function f is uh, distance to a measure. Here we are using only a function with one variable. But density estimation can use high dimensional data like this one here. We see here that we have about one, two, three, four, and five clusters, which correspond to these five hills. So the point is to check the maxima, the maxima of our function that we enable us to predict the number of cluster, given that point close to the density attractor are our potential cluster. And this is not a surprise because this naturally resembles the well-known dendrogram in single linkage clustering. Therefore, the point that are uh, year, I mean, the maxima form a cluster, as we said before. And the problem is that how can we find this maxima? We generally use the well-known hill climbing. What does that mean? That means that for a point X, we find the gradient on X, and that will enable us to climb until we reach the maxima. That means that we climb and stop where the image of the bigger point become less than the image of, a, of the smaller point. If we do it, we will automatically get the peaks of our functions 
which are potential clusters. But there is a problem. The problem is that not all the maxima are our cluster. They are just potential clusters. So how can we distinguish between real clusters and noise? The idea is to measure the persistence of the clusters. How do we do it? We check when the cluster first appears. Check when this maxima, this maximum is obtained is about 0 0.1. And then we check when it dies. It's about 0 0.04. We say that it has uh, died because it is matched with all those clusters. When we have then the birth and the death of the peak, we can then plot that bars in what we call persistence diagram following this strategy. The birth of the cluster is plotted on the X axis and the death of the clusters is plotted on the Y axis. By doing so, for all the bars, you can obtain several dots which correspond to our potential clusters. We have here about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine clusters. Mathematically speaking, we say that we have studied the evolution of the topology of the pre-image of the function zero to infinity on the function alpha to infinity. And to study that evolution of the topology, we compute the zero dimensional persistent diagram of that pre-image. When we do it, we can then use persistent diagram to detect the real cluster and the noise. So the points that are very close to the diagonal represent noise, and those that are far away for the diagonal represent our cluster. That means that on this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six clusters. So we use persistence diagram to estimate the number of clusters the data seem to have. One powerful uh, um, tools that enable us to use the persistent diagram is the stability. What does that mean? Remember that at the beginning, I said that there are some parameters like the smoothing parameter H that enable us to define the function. Let's say that we have chosen a different value of H. That means that automatically we have a different value of a function and therefore we have different uh, bars, let's say right here on this case, the corresponding bars will give us uh, the corresponding dots on the persistence diagram. And the important thing is that all the points are comparable, whether I'm using uh, the first function corresponding to the blue or whether I'm using the uh, other function corresponding to the red dot. Given that they are comparable, I will turns out having the same number of clusters. And this is very useful thanks to the stability of the persistence diagram. Another remark that we want to make here is that the notion of persistence does not always comes from, from point cloud. I know that most of you might be very surprised because the classical pipeline in persistence homology is starting from point cloud, building a nested family of simplices called filtration from which we obtain the persistence diagram. But I would like to tell you that the notion of persistence diagram is not only restricted to point cloud. We can also use functions and thanks to the super level set or the, uh, the sub-level set defined on the function, 
we, we end up computing the persistent diagram and obtain something like this. So whenever I have an increasing sequence of spaces, I can compute the persistence diagram. So in conclusion, you can say that tomato algorithm is very useful when we are dealing with noisy data. Moreover, it automatically enables us to know the clusters and the outliers thanks to the persistence diagram, as I explained here. Here are the outliers, here are the noise. Moreover, tomato is significantly fast as compared to classical clustering algorithm and has a very solid mathematical foundations. Another key feature of tomato is that it can enable us to cluster more uh, complex shape like this one. What do I mean? Tomato performs very well for non-spherical clusters and non-convex uh, one. And this is not the case for classical clustering algorithm like k-min. For example, on this figure, k-min can fail to can fail to obtain the cluster here. Even for the non-spherical here, if you use k-min, you will not obtain these clusters. But uh, some some downside on tomato is that it does not work well when I am dealing with high-dimensional data, and this is no only the case for tomato because the case of dimensionality is a problem, a general problem in data science, meaning that even other clustering algorithms are suffering from the curse of dimensionality and does not work well when I am dealing with high dimensional data. Another issue with tomato is that it requires several I pay parameters and this can be misleading. For example, we need to set the radio size if I'm, we choose graph type as radios. Because at some point of the algorithm tomato, you need to construct neighborhood graph. Tomato also need uh, the density, the function f of as, 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 as I explained. That means that you can choose kernel density estimator or distance to a measure. Tomato also need the smoothing parameter H if you are using density estimate. Another parameter is the learning rate that is very useful in hill climbing. So in conclusion, we can say that tomato is a very nice uh, clustering algorithm because it has few uh, but size and it is very useful in recovering more complex cluster and it automatically detect outliers and noise. In the future tutorial, I will take you through a brief code section of Tomato using Jupyter Notebook for Python. Here is our main reference. Thank you for watching this tutorial. Feel free to ask any question by commenting this tutorial. I'm looking forward to receiving your comment. Bye.